please turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, everybody. This is an Easter series. Next week is Palm Sunday. The week after really is Easter Sunday. And the week after that, we're going to have a spontaneous baptism day that we're excited about. So I hope the next four weeks, including this week, will be a special, special time. The great Charles Spurgeon calls the Gospel of Mark Peter's Gospel. We see a lot of Peter's perspective here. And you know, one of the marks of authenticity of the Bible is that our heroes are not sugar-coated. We see all the problems and all the weaknesses of those that we delight in. Of course, Jesus never sinned. He's the only one who never sinned. But all the other Bible heroes, we see that they are far from perfect. And that encourages me because you know something? We need grace. And because of the grace of God, we stand in Christ today, amen? And I want you to tell someone next to you right now, you need grace. Go on, you tell them that, you need grace. That means undeserved mercy. Now tell somebody on the other side, you need a whole lot of grace. Go on, you tell them that, you need a whole lot of grace. Some of you said that with way too much relish. And uh, one gentleman made the mistake of saying that to his wife. That was not a wise thing to say in church. No, 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 seriously, we do need the grace of God, and we thank God for the grace of God shown to Peter. Now, I have a choice today. Before we read the Scripture together, I have a choice. And this is what this morning's message is all about. Uh, when there's a clash between my will and God's will, and God's will is especially revealed to us through His Word, when my will is not the same as God's will, what's the choice I have? Either to continue to do my will or to adjust my will, surrender my will to God's will, which of course is revealed to us so clearly in the scripture. My will or his will. I want to encourage you today that if we will allow his will to be first, then who knows what God can do in our lives. You know, the credibility of the church of Jesus Christ is often put to test when people realize that we want Jesus, but we don't want the will of Jesus in our choices, the will of Jesus in our marriage, the will of Jesus in our social media and our attitude and just about every part of our lives. If the world can see that there's the will to follow Christ, but we don't really want to do his will in the details of life, there's a problem, amen? And I think we're going to acknowledge that there is a problem here in Peter's life. This morning's message is called Surrendering to My Plans. We begin in Mark 1, verse 16 to 20, as we see the disciples, including Simon Peter. Simon later called Peter. Verse 16, Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Your version may say, I will make you fishers of men. A little child once heard that and thought that they were saying vicious old men. That's not quite right. It's fishers of men, or I will send you out to fish for people. Amen. Verse 18, at once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of God and all his people said, Amen. God intervened in Peter's plans. God took hold of Peter. I wonder what Peter's life would have looked like without Jesus. I've sometimes wondered it myself, had God not taken hold of me as a 14-year-old young man, I really do wonder what would have happened to me. Let's think about Peter's life for a moment. Here's a picture of the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Tiberias. It's sometimes a place I dream of. I've been there a couple of times. Thank you, Lord, for that. Um, but, you know, Peter lived the seafaring life. It's a small a piece of land and fishermen, like my brother, by the way, called Peter, who also grew up as a deep sea fisherman. He's now a marine engineer, so he's got like 44 boats and a ship. He's kind of gone big time with the boat thing, but he grew up just with the small boats in my hometown. You know, fishing folk tend to stay together forever. They're rarely far from the shoreline or the sea, and Peter lives in Capernaum and fishes from that same harbor. It's a hard life. You have to get up early in the morning, but it's got its compensations as well, that beautiful sunrise. 
You're captain of your own ship, master of your own destiny. You've got a community, a band of brothers. I took this photograph last week when visiting back with my daughter Megan, my hometown, Tynmouth, and that was just about uh, eight days ago there. And uh, some of those fishing folk used to gather in our kitchen when my brother was a fisherman, and uh, their names were brilliant. You know, one of them was called Lugsy, and then there was Niblo, and there was Paul. Paul taught us how to do high pour tea. We sometimes have this joke in our executive team. I sometimes ask the team, do you want high pour or low pour? And they know what's going, and they have to say high pour because a low pour cup of tea is like this, but you know a high pour, you pour it like this. It's really awesome. So, you know, Paul taught us how to do high pour tea, and my brother Peter, he never had a nickname. They probably didn't dare give him a funny name. But, you know, those fishermen, they stick together. They work hard. They're up in the middle of the night. Uh, sometimes... You know, people worry about them uh, staying alive. My mum used to worry every time a ship went down off the southwest coast of England, was reported on the news. You always wondered, because we didn't have cell phones in those days, you always wondered, how's my brother? And then my brother came home, uh, he'd be tired out, and he would fall asleep in the bath. He was so exhausted from four days fishing, he'd fall asleep in the bath, we could hear him snoring. My mum would knock on the door, she'd go, Peter, Peter. She, tried, she was afraid he would drown in the bath. Uh, she was afraid he would drown at sea. She was always afraid he would drown, but he's, he's lived to tell the tale right now. But you know, it's unlikely that Peter would have been a traveler. It's unlikely that he would have gone 40 miles west to the great sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and become a great seafarer. He was staying around that sea of Galilee. But I want you to consider this. Peter would die in Rome as a martyr and become one of the great men of history, a missionary in Europe, with several thousand churches still today named after him. The first thing I want to say to us today is get ready for your plans to be interrupted. You know, Peter had plans. He had expectations of what his life would look like. And then God burst into his life when Jesus simply says, by his shore, by his environment, come and follow me. Maybe Peter would have just carried on living forever in Capernaum. He's often called impetuous Peter. So I sometimes wonder, without Jesus, whether he would have got himself into trouble. We don't know what would have happened. We do know that he was probably a God-fearer because when Jesus worked a miracle by the shore the first time, Peter said, away from me, I'm a sinful man. Peter almost certainly would have worshipped in the synagogue in Capernaum where many today have visited that synagogue. It's the very same site. It's considered a grade A site without a doubt. We know that would have been where Peter's family would have worshipped. His house was almost certainly very close to that as well. And so Peter didn't know about God but when he encountered Jesus, the first thing he became aware of was a sense of sinfulness, and that's the right way forward to discover our Savior. We need to realize that we've sinned, but that Christ has come for us, amen? But is it possible that Peter, though a God-fearer, could have gone through all his life and still not actually known the living God until he met Jesus? I wonder what Peter would have filled his life with had he not followed uh, the kingdom of God. I wonder whether he'd got got into trouble. I wonder whether he'd got into drink, got into girls, got into sinful practices. You know, idols are there often to fill a void for us. There's a God-shaped hole in every one of us. And if that God-shaped hole is not filled with the true living God, man will go and find something else to satisfy ourselves with. And some get depressed by life. And we just exist. We're just kind of trying to make it through to the next day. There's often a story of a leader, a pastor, a politician, a teacher, a businessman who got caught in a sin and that sin gets exposed and it's very, very painful. Who knows what would have happened to Peter? What we do know is that Jesus says, come follow me and Peter does. By the grace of God, he's now following Jesus. I want us to learn a little bit more about Peter in Mark chapter 3, verse 16. These are the 12 that Jesus appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. So Peter has responded to following Jesus, if you like. He's got saved. He's following the Lord. It's not strictly true because Christ is yet to die and rise again. But you get what my drift. You get what I mean. He's entering the kingdom of God. He's learning about Jesus. And now Jesus gives him a new name. He becomes one of the 12. He becomes an apprentice. And then in Mark 5, 35, we read that Jesus didn't let anyone follow him on this particular occasion except who? Peter, 
James and John, the brother of James. Peter becomes so trusted that he's now part of the inner circle of Jesus, those group, that group called the Three. So can you imagine the privilege that Peter is singled out to be someone who stays very close to Jesus at this vital time in Jesus' ministry? Well, could it be that God even wants to invite you to be part of his inner circle, for you to be his trusted followers, the ones he entrusts his secrets and his mission to? May the Lord include all of us. So let's follow the story. Peter goes from his sinfulness to being cleansed by Christ. He's following Jesus. He's called into ministry. He's called to be a fisher of men. He's in the inner circle. It's going well, but I'll tell you something. There's a lot more for God yet to work in Peter. If you agree with me, say, yes, Reese. If you like, the land has been plowed over once. But you know what? That, that land can harden. It needs to be plowed over again. Have you noticed that God does that with you? And you can be discouraged and disappointed, and you can think, well, I thought I'd already dealt with that. Well, you know, sometimes the heart just hardens up, and we need, we need God to do a fresh work in our lives again. Well, Peter needed to be growing in his faith. But today, we're going to see that one of the great keys to the kingdom of God is to exchange my will for God's will. There's God's will, and there's my will, and you may have noticed that the two are not always the same. When we can understand God's will more fully, and when we can understand that we have a tendency to step out of that will, we're starting to understand the keys to the kingdom. May my will be His will. Many never get over this hump. They're always struggling, carnal Christians, fleshly Christians. That's why the fleshly Christian will so easily fall away because we don't want to do God's will. We run when God tells us to do what he tells us to do. Like Jonah was given a clear command, but because Jonah did not want to do the will of God, he wanted to dream his dream. And off he goes to Tarshish and ends up deep down in the sea, saved by the grace of God. Our will is not always the same as God's will. Our feelings come into it. We have a lot of feelings and emotions. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones would say the scripture always appeals first to the mind. Our feelings tell us something. Our feelings are important. We particularly have to be kind to other people's feelings. But let me tell you something as a follower of Jesus Christ. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And our minds are transformed especially through the reading, the study, the teaching, and the proclamation of the Word of God. That's why you have to speak it out sometimes. In fact, we have to speak out the Word of God often because our emotions want to go one way, but the Word of God is clear and the Word of God is true. Our will must ultimately bow down to King Jesus. And you may have noticed that Peter is a very willful person. We often say, well, they're a willful person, and that's a willful person. We're all willful people in the sense that all of us have desires. All of us have hopes and dreams. We, all of us want to lean in a preferred direction. All of us have a preferred imagination of how we want the world to be. Yeah, one of my favorite YouTube videos, I don't know why I watched it more than twice, but, uh, but there was this, this lady in a shopping mall who was uh, on a phone, she was texting, and she, she's walking towards a fountain it's awesome. You, you, got to, you had to see it for yourself. She's walking towards the fountain. She's looking at a phone. She's looking at a phone like this. Here's the, here's the shopping mall fountain. I've got to watch it. Don't fall over here. Walking at the phone. She goes straight in the fountain. And she gets something. She's not very happy. And so, I don't know. I was just tempted to watch it a second and a third time. Is that weird or something? Forgive me, brothers and sisters, but I just had to see it a third time just to check that she did actually fall in the fountain a third time. But uh, do you know what this lady did? Instead of kind of dusting herself down and going like, you know something, that was not the smartest thing to do. Instead, you know what she did? She sued the mall. And, and I, tell you, I was telling this story, I felt I was supposed to tell this story. Anyway, at the South Campus this morning, um, someone had spilt some coffee. I hadn't realized this. But uh, you know, I was, I was um, talking and walking, you know, I was kind of walking this way, talking to people, you know, being friendly to everybody like you're supposed to do in church. And I'm walking backwards. And uh, apparently someone had spilt some coffee at the South Campus in the foyer there. And they put up one of those yellow warning signs. I tripped over the warning sign. I'm suing. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding there. But you know something, when we fall, when we make our own mistakes, 
uh, when we do something foolish, it's very easy just to be embarrassed and get angry at everybody. And Peter has that tendency from time to time as well. But, uh, but we're going to see that when Peter fails, the Lord Jesus is so gracious to us. Nobody needs to be sued. Nobody needs to be beaten up. But I thank God for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's working on Peter. And we're going to see now in Mark chapter 8, let's turn there to our second reading. We're halfway through our message, so don't worry. This, is, this was not a long introduction, okay? I'm halfway through the message right now. But Mark chapter 8 tells us a story. But I think we can summarize what we're saying so far by this, this uh, comment on the screen here. What we want... Do you agree with me? What we want is not always the same as what God wants. Have you noticed that about yourself? What you want, what I want, is not always the same as what God wants, but what God desires is always better than what we desire. Do you agree with me? Say yes, Reese, if you agree. Yes, it's true, isn't it? It's not always the same. I don't always want the same thing as God. But the great exchange that needs to take place is for you and I to say, and if we do it collectively as the church, when we say, I want your will, God. And when we discover what his will is, and when we walk in his power and strength and we actually do his will, what liberation, joy, and freedom and blessing is when we do the will of God. So Mark 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? Jesus was kind of asking for an opinion poll survey of what they thought of his ministry. Not because Jesus was insecure and wanted to know what people thought, but because Jesus was about to declare who he is. Amen? Notice that the word of God does not go along with the opinion polls. Hallelujah for that. And so they say, verse 28, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, one of the prophets but what about you he says who do you say I am Peter answered and this is a holy moment he's making some progress now he goes you are the Messiah another version says you're the Christ the son of the living God and we say well done Peter that's correct Peter Jesus is the Messiah you're doing well Yes, he's the son of God. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's our savior. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Messiah kind of summarizes all those phrases. The problem is that's not precisely what Peter meant. Peter was not thinking of the crucified and risen savior that the Old Testament prophesies and Jesus prophesies and who Jesus is as he dies and rises. Peter is instead thinking of a victorious king who will beat up the Romans. Because that's his preferred future of how the world shall be. Israel will be strong again. The country will be happy again. And everything's cool. The Messiah Peter wants will be a spiritual Alexander the Great or Napoleon or Washington all in one. Storm in Norman Messiah. Read on. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed. And after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. So Jesus takes the phrase that Peter uses, you are the Messiah, and then he explains God's will, not man's will, for the Messiah, God's will for the Messiah and declares that the anointed one will be a suffering servant who will be a sacrifice for sin. There's no mystery here. And then we read, what next? Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Many people try to denigrate Jesus. He's not the son of God. He's just a good man. The cross was not a sacrifice for sin, just an example of a good life. But Peter had seen Jesus calm the waters, miraculously command fish, and he knew about fishing. He healed his mother-in-law. I trust he wasn't bitter about that. Yeah, that was a joke, and probably a really bad one as well. Probably not the best joke to use in church. Thank you, Al. I got a preacher laugh there from you there. Jesus healed just about every single person in Peter's hometown. Peter gets it right. You are the Messiah. But Peter does not like the idea of a crucified and risen Messiah, and nor do many in this world today. Here's the next phrase on the screen. The problem is that we have a predisposed will and imagination of what we think will work best. 
Peter had his own will for the Messiah. Peter had his own cunning plan for how Messiah would be successful. And each one of us, we have a fantasy in our minds of how things should be. And so when those things don't work out, we may get very angry at God. I sometimes hear people say, I'm angry at God. I say, well, is God your little brother? Is God your fund manager? Is God like that person in the car weaving in and out on their cell phone? Is God like that and you're angry at them? You're angry at him? Is he not God, by the way? I'm angry at who? God. Isn't God God? God's not our little brother. And we get, things are not working out the way I want them to be. I'm not saying that life isn't hard. Life can deal with some terrible, painful blows. I understand that. But the best thing, friends, is not to be angry at God, but to accept the will of God, amen? Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, thy, what, will be done. Surrender is the only way. As long as we're fighting God, as long as we're not accepting God's will in our life, there's not much joy, freedom, or liberation. When that battle goes on, there's a grating that goes on in someone's life. You can see it from time to time. That person that just cannot submit to the will of God, fighting God's will, it's a painful place when we, we are acting that way ourselves. Okay, here's the thing. Having my will separate from God's will is not going to work. And if I want to fish for men, to try to fish for men my way and not God's way is not going to work. And I think very often the Christian is asking, well, what can I get away with? Can, can I still do this and be a Christian? Can I still have that idol? Can I still sin in that way? I wonder whether a much better question to ask is, God, how can I do your will? I accept, Lord, that I'm way more likely to mess my life up. Everything you want for me, God, is good and right and perfect. So God, help me to accept your will. Can you imagine the release and freedom our church could have today if everyone in this gathering this day, on this great day, if every one of us could say, God, I want your will for my life. I'm willing to completely submit to you absolutely whatever you tell me to do. Don't you think there'll be a tremendous release of the Spirit, my friends? And that's gonna affect our community and our nation and our world. Let's desire God's will. I know it's easy to say. It's another thing to truly desire it. And Jesus, how does he respond to Peter? Well, he could have said, well, Peter's a, an influential man. He's, the, he's in the three. Uh, his, his mother's a big deal. Peter's got all the fishing industry behind him in Capernaum. Capernaum is known still as Jesus Town. So there, there Jesus is. Um, being in, in Caesarea Philippi, there's the crowd following him. Jesus might be concerned, well, if I tell Peter off, I'll offend his kin, and, and that whole clan will be offended, and I, I offend Peter, and then all the other disciples will get disaffected. And I just want to say, brother and sister, don't ever use your position in the body of Christ to stand against the will of God. That's what Peter was trying to do. Lord, I'm going to rebuke you. You're not going to go to the cross. There's not going to be a resurrection. This is going to be a different kind of ministry. We're going to get the sword out. And we're going to kill the Romans. This is a vital moment in spiritual history. And Jesus, instead of worrying about what everybody thought, Jesus simply does the right thing and declares the word of God and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now that'll wake a meeting up, won't it? <laughs> Satan, Jesus says, why did Jesus say it like that? Could it be that Jesus understood that this is the battle in every human soul, including his own, which never sinned? But the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way, and the biggest temptation you and I will ever have is the temptation of our identity to cease to be who we are called to be. Amen. Let's turn now to one more scripture, Mark 14. Verse 36, I wonder if you knew I was headed this way, if you know the Bible. Mark 14, 36. Could it be that Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, because he could see the devil in that question? Avoid the cross. Don't go to the cross. Have a Christianity without a cross and a resurrection. I'm still sure there are plenty of folks that would love to do that. They would love to make Christianity just 
principles. They would love to make Christianity just a, a, a set of rules. Instead, rather, we have, we have a cross. We have resurrection. We have a sacrifice for our sins and everlasting life. We have the power of the Holy Spirit with us. And so in Mark 14, 36, it's now in the Garden of Gethsemane, five days after Palm Sunday. It's in the last week, the last, in fact, hours of the life of Jesus. Jesus is with Peter, and Peter's come a long way. Peter's still with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're going to see next week the boast that he makes and how he falls into the fountain himself. Abba, Father, Jesus said. This is a gut prayer. The first thing a child says in America is mama or dada. In Israel, it's Abba, Abba, Father. And so Jesus goes, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. And then Jesus prays a prayer which shows that it's permissible for us to ask God for things when it seems like his will is not going our way. Jesus prays, take this cup from me. It's okay to pray for healing and God can heal. It's okay to pray for your marriage and God can restore marriages. It's okay to pray for, for someone who's far away from God. Absolutely, we know those are prayers that God loves to answer, amen? In fact, put your hands up if you know that we need the power of prayer in our lives. Absolutely, we need prayer. And, and it's okay for Jesus to recognize that his Father's will appears to be through the course of history, focusing on one key moment, a cross. The Father's direction is clearly leading Jesus to the cross. And Jesus senses there, like every human being, that his will is, not, is struggling to line up with the will of the Father. Don't misunderstand me on this, because Jesus never sinned. He remained in perfect communion with the Father. Jesus almost seems to recognize that we can have one will and the Father another. Take this cup from me. Perhaps this is the key moment that leads us to Calvary. Yet not what I will, says Jesus. Is that spiritual maturity as we tell our story, friends? Yet not what I will, or not my will, not my way. Can you just declare with me, not my will, everybody, after three, one, two, three, not my will. That's the battle that goes on. Even right now, you can feel the, the emotions and the direct. It's like, do I really want to do God's will? Not my will. Then what does Jesus say? But what you will. Say that with me, everyone. But what you will. What you will. One more time. What you will. Can I say, friends, to encourage us, Jesus never asks us to do something that he's not already done himself. Do you agree? What a wonderful Savior we have. Isn't it marvelous what Jesus has done for us? If we do nothing else today, let's just be blown away with what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And you could argue that though it began before the beginning of time, though it began when he was born as a babe in Bethlehem, perhaps it begins especially when he goes, not my will, but what you will. What a wonderful Savior we have. And therefore, Jesus does not have a will separate from the Father. Though tempted to have a separate will from the Father, he never diverges from the will of God, even though he's truly human. Can we just say hallelujah, what a Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that our Savior went all the way. And so really, that's what our first step is in our Easter meditation, if you like. Let's determine to do the will of God in our lives, in every part of our lives. And I want to challenge each one of us and encourage each one of us that as we step into God's will, that's the best place to be. In fact, who really wants to be out of the will of God? We can slip so easily. We can be tempted to do that. I don't need to be baptized. Can I watch that on my computer? I don't need to witness. I don't need to fish for men. We can be tempted to do that. You know, St. Patrick, the, the story has been told very sweetly in recent days, and it's there on, online increasing the story of Patrick, even though... That seems to be a different tradition to us, or rather many have taken that tradition and made something of it. I thank God that in the fifth century, with Europe taken hold of by paganism, and especially Britain taken hold of 
paganism. God took hold of Patrick and said, I want you to go back to Ireland. I believe he didn't just change Ireland, but the world was changed through that. We don't need to paint the town green or turn the river green as they do in Chicago. What we need to do instead is to say, not my will, but your will. Let this Easter time be a journey when each one of us get closer and closer to the will of God in our lives. And when it comes to salvation, above all, the big get thee behind me, Satan, the big spiritual battle going on in our culture right now is to say it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. It's not the cross. It's not the resurrection. I can earn my way to God. All religions are equal. God does not judge. There is no hell. We hear those things being said all the time. But I tell you something, without Jesus Christ, we are lost and we're going to hell. But with Jesus Christ, it's amazing grace. Our sins are forgiven and we have everlasting life. Not my will, Jesus says, but yours be done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God that the will of God did not diverge from the will of the Son of God. It's, I've heard it said the national anthem of hell is, I did it my way. The national anthem of hell. Get thee behind me, Satan, to that. Peter was tempted to deny the cross, but I assure you, friends, that the cross is what we need, not my will. So I'm going to ask us to respond today as we kind of kick off Easter, as we move into this Easter um, season. I'd love us to respond together by saying, you know what? I'm going to do the will of God. And I wonder whether we as a church can say, God, whatever you tell us to do, and it's especially revealed to us in your word, I accept the word of God. Lord, I'm responding to the good news of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask our musicians to come. And we're going to respond to God right now. You know, we're, and we're at this point in our service quite early on in the service, so you don't need to rush away. The Methodists are already at O'Charlie, so you've missed it already, okay? So I'm going to ask us to stand together, all right, and just have some holy moments as a church where we kind of go into the Garden of Gethsemane and we identify with Jesus and we say, not my will, but your will, Lord. Can we respond to him now? Please come and join me at the front. Hey, you might even want to bring your Bible. Bring your Bible. Or bring, bring your iPad or your phone, even if your Bible's on that. And just, that, that needs to be surrendered to God as well, doesn't it? Bring your, your laptop or whatever you've got right now with your Bible on. But just bring it forward and just say, God, I want to do your will. I respond to you now, Lord Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship. sing that song again we really lift our hearts in praise to God just as in this quiet place as we surrender to God right now I just want to ask maybe there's someone here you're just really battling you're just really battling against the will of God I just want to encourage you that when you relinquish your life to God he will never let you down Amen. you may you may go to jail like Peter did or like Paul did you may be persecuted but I tell you something, don't fear those that harm the body. Fear those that can harm the soul. Amen. And we need to understand that there are all kinds of spiritual dangers, all kinds of pulls away from the kingdom. I'm going to bless the children to say, today, children, and say, I thank God for you. Give your life to Jesus. Desire God's will for every part of your life. I want to say to our students, we thank God for you. We just pray for God's richest blessing on your life. The world will tempt you in all kinds of ways keep doing the will of God and sometimes you even have to say now don't say it to their face don't say get thee behind me Satan to their face okay that's not a good plan especially to your teacher that's, that's not a good thing to say okay but sometimes you have to say it in the back of your minds I recognize that as an attack of the enemy and that's not right for me I want to bless 
our Sunday school family group teachers, uh, those who are shape leaders. God bless you. It really does matter what you do and how you follow that soul up who's just a little difficult to handle, that person that keeps disappearing you, especially on a rainy Sunday, you know. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you to our ministry leaders. Thank you to our deacons, our ministers, our staff, our team. We bless one another today, and I tell you something, if we can all collectively go, I want the will of God in my life, there will be a wonderful release of blessing in our church, amen.